<laughs> okay, cool. All right, anyway, my name's um, Leon Baird, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you um, a rundown today with some of the latest industry ideas and thoughts and practices on creating interactive documents, and particularly why and how you might want to use HTML5 to do this. Okay, so I'm going to go through quite a few things. I'm not going to get very technical with this, and certainly I'm not going to be going through any HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or programming. And in fact, I'm going to try to do the opposite of that. I'm going to try to stay as far away from code as possible to try to give you an overview of what exists if you don't want to do any coding at all, which is always nice. How many of you are coders and developers? A few of you. Well, aren't you lucky? You've got extra powers built in then because you've therefore got more options. But for those of you who are not and who are um, designers and print people, um, then instead I'm going to try to go through some options. But the ideas and the practices and the few things of what's going on at the moment will be interesting, I think, to most people because um, you're probably all very familiar with the idea of documents and probably very familiar with the idea of websites. But there's a new practice coming along which is fusing those two concepts together and finding traditional document platforms a bit bothersome, looking to use new platforms like HTML5 for documents rather than just a traditional website. And it's actually just applying what you already know and love from one idiom but transmogrifying it into another idiom to be something quite interesting, or I think interesting anyway. We'll see by the end of it. If the room is empty, we know it wasn't that interesting. So, in terms of um, what it is, when we start off with documents, we think about it from the day and the age of print as something which is a very simple reading experience and a design experience. You've got content, you've got paper, you can look at it. And then there's been a constant demand, really, in the last sort of 10 20 years to try to translate that into something which is what people describe often as a media-rich interactive experience, which usually just means it's clickable and it usually has got video on it somewhere, which is, people are quite often happy with that. If you can do more than that, they're really happy. But at its basics, that's sort of what they're, what they're sort of looking for. And there's been traditional ways that we can do that when we want to create these nice um, document experiences. Now, as we move through to do that, we have to be aware that when we start to make documents interactive and we start to look at documents, there are actually different types of documents. And each type could take a different approach as to the best ways if you want to create interactive documents, you can actually do it. Now, there's the traditional long reading document, <coughs> which is sort of the business report, all the stuff that designers hate doing. And usually, if you were actually laying something out in InDesign, you'd usually have what people would often refer to as a flawed document, which is basically a very heavily templated design where the content, usually prepared in Word, flows into the design and just literally runs through multiple pages. And it doesn't really have a high design stake other than typography styles with headings and settings and margins and guides, but it's still nonetheless a valid form of document that often now there is a demand to make even these simpler types of things interactive and easier to digest digitally when you're on the go and you're looking around. Of course, there is other types of documents as well, which I would consider the advanced page layout document, and that's whereby the document has a lot more substantial design to it and layout, and has explicit content in places where it's got to be this far from the left, and it's got to look like this and be styled like that. And it has a design to it, not just a flow of data. So it actually has page layout. And that's a sort of another type of document. And finally, the other type of document could be really the document which is all based around the image, which again is another thing that's become quite popular, like the photo book, uh, you know, that contains lots of images, very little readable content, but lots of images to look at and lots of things to see. And again, those are the sorts of things, that I would say, three easy categories. I mean, if you get into it, there's a lot more than that, but those are three simple ones to think about. And I'm sure if you've worked with design, you've done these three types of documents all over the place. Now, when we're going to do these, word processors are usually the main ground for preparing the really simple page layout documents. And as we go through to the others, it gets a bit more fancy because then you'd be rolling out things like page layout software, like DTP packages in design or Quark, or more heavy duty software. And folder books probably would be the same DTP program, although many people, when they're doing those sorts of books, because they're usually tied in with very good print offers, are using cloud-based software to design their books online, just basically uploading a pile of photographs, laying it out and designing it, or using some photo software like iPhoto, Aperture or Lightroom to design their contents and create it. So when we go over, there's existing document formats already that people are using to distribute documents. I just want to address those first before we go into anything, just to sort of say about those formats and what the problems are when you try to do digital and interactive content with those. Now, first of all is the PDF. 
And the PDF is great because the PDF, of course, stores print content very nicely. So it will keep your document looking exactly like it would when it goes to print. And when you look about it on your machines, it will in no way at all differ or vary from what you see. And you can put hyperlinks and you can put bookmarks into it to make it more navigatable. So you can literally say, here's a front cover, list of contents, jump around and go from A to B. Of course, you also as well, if you're going to get very clever, you can design interactive forms, multimedia, flash content, and there is a full working JavaScript engine inside of um, the Adobe PDF document formats that you can use if you wish to make it heavily interactive, almost like a web page, in fact, with as much control as a web page. And you can even do other things like make your form PDFs lifecycle documents, whereby they tie in with network services, they have dynamic content rolling in, it uses JSON just the same way a website would do, and it can adapt to user content, although not many people do that. Has anybody ever done that? Tumbleweed blows through the room. Yeah, that's usually the case, but it's doable for the three people in the country who play with that sort of technology. Now, the drawback is, when you come to do this, and you're playing around with PDF and all those possibilities, and I've talked about this before, but it's still worth just checking. If you develop, if you develop in this document and you put it out there, the user experience with PDF is far from consistent. So when you're opening on a PC, a Mac, or on mobile devices, what you actually see and get varies depending on the platforms that the user is digesting it. So on the PC, there is no real PDF technology built into the thing itself. So if you're going to do it on a PC, you have to go and get something. And nearly everybody gets Acrobat or Reader. Okay? And um, all designers of Acrobat, all the normal public have Reader. And um, it's great because Reader's free. And you know if you're sending a PDF out and it's going to Windows or a PC-based platform, that's a technology that will be used. And you know exactly the user experience they're going to get. And all of this is usable, which is very nice. But the drawback starts to occur on other platforms. Now, if you go to the Mac, the Mac also has Adobe Reader and Acrobat, which is exactly the same as it is on the PC. And again, you'll get access to all of that content if you're distributing it. But where it differs is the Mac, unlike the PC, does have PDF built in at its core. And when you get it out of the box, it does PDF. So therefore, most people, when they get a Mac and do it, they go, oh, it opens PDF, and that's it. They never go any further than that. So as a result, they tend to stick to the default, which is Quick Look and Preview. And sadly, Quick Look and Preview doesn't support any of that functionality. So you lose all of the interactive multimedia content. Just shows up as a lovely, affectionate, white open space on your document, which isn't the exciting interactive platform you were rather hoping you would deliver. And it gets worse when you go on mobile phones and tablets because you can get Adobe Reader for most of the common platforms, but again, Adobe Reader for the mobile devices tends not to be compatible with all of those different things. It can sometimes do forms, but very often because a lot of the multimedia side is depending on the flash runtime being installed on the machine, or it uses in some way the flash runtime, then of course you get a much more limited aperture of possibilities. So, and the other worst thing is, most people on mobile devices don't have Adobe Reader. As just a little quick check, how many have actually got Adobe Reader on their phones? Oh, more than I would have thought, but most haven't. How many of you got it on your tablets? Same sort of statistics. So a very small number of people will be able to get forms and all of those other things, print content, hyperlinks, and bookmarks, but not the multimedia side. And of course, if you don't have it at all, then God knows what you'll be using, because then it's down to the device and what's on there to interpret the PDF in that way. So as a result, you send a lovely document out, you open it up on your tablet, and what you see is lots of white areas and not a lot of content. So that's always been a problem with PDF. So it rules out instantly all the good stuff and whittles you down to print hyperlinks and bookmarks is the only reliable thing you can deliver platform agnostic. Now, one of the other drawbacks as well is mainly when you think about mobile, because PDF, when you generate it, has a fixed size. It doesn't get bigger or smaller. It doesn't respond to the screen sizes. So as a result of that, if you've got a big 25-page report as a PDF, it is very often not very nice to read it on the phone because you have to pinch and zoom in to see it very close, scroll around, and it, it's very disorientating because when you can't see the whole design, you lose track of where you are, and it's not a very pleasurable read. So you might dip into something, but you certainly wouldn't want to use it if you're out on your phone. And it's not much better on tablets, and even on desktop, it still feels disorientating because you still have to zoom in and out to read the document and digest it, unless the user, of course, made it bespoke size for digital. So if they actually put it out at like an iPad size, it would be easier to use and read. But of course, most of these, when they're generated, are direct transcripts of what goes to print. So you get lovely big A4 documents with teeny tiny text. So you've got to zoom in 
and read those documents. So that's one of the issues with PDF. Does that make sense? So therefore, it's a good platform to use, but you have very limited options if you want to be platform agnostic. But if you know where it's going and you know it's going to land on a Windows PC, then it's easy to use all of those features uninhibited. But if you're wanting it to be open to the public where anybody can use it, you have to rein in what you do. And also being not responsive, it's not ideal if you're wanting it to really be a document for mobile consumption. Now, of course, there is then the mighty EPUB. That comes in two flavors, EPUB 2 and EPUB 3. Now, of course, EPUB, what is an EPUB? Anyone? It's a website. It's a website in a zip file. So an EPUB is actually a website in a zip file where EPUB 2 is based on HTML4 and EPUB 3 is based on HTML5. So the contents are kept there in a zip file, so it actually does use web technology. Now, drawbacks with EPUB 2 are it's very compatible. It works on any device that can do EPUB, but its biggest limitation is it has no style or design content. So the content literally flows. You can't even usually choose the font. The font is chose by the device reading it, as is the size. All you're really doing is delivering content and saying, I want a picture here, and I want a picture here. And you get amazing control over things like space, how big a space are between the paragraphs, and color. I'd like that word, that color. But once you go beyond space and color, you don't have that much more control over the document. You've got some limited control, like you might be able to put two things side by side by using HTML floats, but often most devices will ignore that and just do a simple flow. Now, if you are wanting to use EPUB 2, the easiest way to make those is with word processors because it is like a word process document flowed. So um, Apple's Pages, if any of you are Mac users and have got Pages, it's probably the best one to use because you can literally just go to Export EPUB and that will pop a nice EPUB 2 and it will take as much of the styling as it can. But EPUB 3 can be a little bit sort of trickier to generate. And also EPUB 3 as well is slightly problematic in the sense that it doesn't deliver a consistent experience yet. Because it's still being worked out and still being argued about and people are still fighting over how it should work, many devices that do support it very often have slight different renderings of the content you give. And sometimes you can give beautiful responsive content that's designed to fit on devices and other times that fails to render and instead you're back to delivering just a flow of content very similarly to the way EPUB 2 is delivered. Now, originally, EPUB 3s were very tricky things to design and make because uh, programs like InDesign would very easily make an EPUB 2 and it would make an EPUB 3, but it wouldn't do a fixed layout design with it. But very recently, um, it's had a few updates which can enable you to do a lot more with InDesign for making EPUB 3s. But another drawback, apart from making them, is the fact that the user must install software on nearly all the devices that needs to use them. Okay, so on PC and on older Macs, you need to choose an EPUB software, and you tend to find desktop software has a radically different rendering quality than mobile software, where it often looks cheap and not very nice. And mobile devices as well, you can get a good, great deal of variation. It may look beautiful in one app, and in another app, it might look like a bucket of muck and not look very good at all. So the tricky bit is getting software there and using it. However, that's changed on the Mac because Apple have now built into all the latest versions of OS X and their mobile platforms, iBook, which delivers now a beautiful rendering and consistent performance. But again, that's platform based. So if you know you're going to send an EPUB to a Mac user or an iPad or iPhone user, very nice. But if you're going to send it out into the wilds, who knows what it's going to land upon and it won't be consistent. Now, like I said before, InDesign has had a recent change, and there's a little example by the wonderful Marianne Conception, who's doing um, a fixed layout EPUB. Now, a fixed layout EPUB, it's interesting to note that that's really not platform agnostic because it only works really on iPad. It's a format supported by iPad, and if you use it, it's only going to render well on iPads. But the problem was before, even if you wanted to do that, you had to put out from InDesign your EPUB, crack it open, and then get stuck in and rewrite all the HTML and CSS and spend a long time doing web design, which is great for developers but not for designers. But now from the new version of InDesign, you can now do fixed layout EPUBs entirely from InDesign and export it out without having to do the traditional thing of cracking it open and write code. And unlike many solutions, uh, you've probably seen there are loads of plugins for InDesign that makes EPUBs. But when you open them up, you get a gigantic photograph for each page. And that's all you've got. Whereas here, the text would be all selectable because it would be proper HTML5 content that would be representing your designs. Horribly written HTML5 content. All developers, if you cracked it open, you'd be sick. But 
it would be at least HTML5 content that you could play with. So does that make sense? So that's really where you are at with EPUBs as well. And of course, if you're going to be platform non-agnostic and you want to go for the iPad anyway, a much better option is iBook Author that will generate um, very heavily interactive media-rich books for iPad that again will open up on iBook and in there you can do all sorts of really impressive interactive things. Uh, you can even do keynote animations and have them interactive so the user can click around and things slide on and slide off screen. And also as well, it is actually based on HTML5. So as a result of that, any HTML5 widgets or whatnots that you want to stick on the page, you can because it will allow you to plug in any HTML5 content yourself. So that allows you to do all sorts of impressive, immersive things. And um, Put those out, but again, not platform agnostic, limited to just the iPad. So that's just a very quick summary of existing document formats that are out there, and just to make, take two of the most popular ones, EPUBs and PDF, and just to say why they're problematic when you want to create interactive documents, and why when you do them, although very often there are really great, simple, and easy authoring tools, it's not always the case that you're going to get what you actually want to expect. So that's why people have been looking for alternatives. And HTML5 has kept coming up again and again and again as an alternative document format. Okay? So why is that? Well, it's platform agnostic. If you deliver your content in HTML5, it will work everywhere with virtual identical offerings irrelevant of the device or the operating system that is used to render the content. It's also responsive design. So as well, you can do beautiful, heavily designed content with layout as you like, and actually it can adapt elegantly to page size and move around and change and alter. So on a phone, your design is made for the thin, slim, tall screen, an iPad, the slightly wider screen, and on a desktop, a more landscape type screen that allows you to look at the document. Of course, remembering that in all cases, you've still got vertical scrolling. People forget about that. You can still scroll web pages, and preferably not with loads of animation diving out the seams at you as you're scrolling with all this new annoying age of parallax scroll effects that make you want to go back to paper and print. Now, the other thing as well, of course, is in HTML5, you also as well can have video and audio natively and, and that also ties in exactly to the same formats used by most mobile devices. So if you record a bit of video on most mobile devices, it's already in the HTML5 MPEG-4 format. So it makes it super easy to add to your designs. And of course, you can do animations as well and even have interactive animations. And if you're a developer, you can, of course, crack open a canvas and get writing. It may cause internal bleeding, but you can do it nevertheless. If you're a non-developer, then there are a lot of code-free solutions to do interactive animations. I'll talk about a couple of those. So you can create lovely content on there, which is really impressive and looks really great. Of course, you've also got access to things we've been putting onto web pages anyway for years. Maps, interactive Google Maps. Uh, you know, the satellite modes and all these other things. And of course, 3D maps are coming in the lift as well. So you'll very eventually have the same style of Apple-y flyover maps. Or, of course, you've got Street View as well. Um, charts, there's a whole pile of products on offer to generate interactive HTML5 charts that can either be used for existing web services where you make them from Excel documents or they can actually be plugged into content management systems so you can generate these things more easily as part of your design. And of course HTML5 tables which are pretty much like tables, boring, <laughs> but still available nonetheless. And of course hyperlinks and pages, okay, where you can have differing pages of the document go from one page to another, but of course you can also link to other parts of the page, which means one of the things that gets needed a lot in certain types of documents are footnotes. So therefore it means with the page links, where you can link to the bottom of the page and back up to the top, you can very easily do things like footnotes, or with a bit of love and care, you can actually have footnotes that you click and they could pop open in a bubble. So you could read them in situ, don't have to be at the bottom of the page, but you could for tradition, if you wish. And, of course, heavily designed content. CSS3, which, of course, is part of HTML5, allows you to do design with almost as much control as you get in the DTP program, like InDesign, whereby you've got total typographic control, you've got gradients, you've got rounded corners, you've got drop shadows, you've got glow effects, you've got inner glow effects, you can do bevel and embosses, and, of course, even reflections. And that's before you look that you can actually do things in 3D. So again, very simply, have animations and objects, design a panel, and it can spin in three-dimensionally with a reflection underneath, work with it, and it can slide off again. And all of this is very easy in HTML5 and CSS3. So it allows you to suddenly think really creatively about the document that's there. Now, developers, hands up again. You've got the best options because you can use all of that 
including the 3D, because some of that, of course, there is no real WYSIWYG code free options to do all of that. But, of course, any system can be adapted. And with a developer, um, it's a really good idea if you find the developers in here, keep them as a pet in a box <laughs> next to your print-based workflows. And then that will allow you to then open it like this box of magic and go, <clears throat> can you make that 3D, please? Or can you make that have a reflection and anything? Wonderful things can happen. But I'll go through what you can do realistically without too much code. So does that make sense? So that's why HTML5 is an interesting platform to use because it gives you that holy grail of it will work everywhere the same and give you all of these wonderful design features. Now, when we come to looking at distributing documents, how would you give somebody some HTML5? Do you just you know, give it in an envelope or do you have to have a wheelbarrow full of it? How do you pass it around? Well, of course, with PDF, we would stick it off in emails. We would put maybe it on our websites, on our content management systems, and then link to it. So when you're on your website, there'll be a big list of PDFs, and you click a link, and up it will open in a tab, and you'll then have a new document. Or it could be stored locally on your machine, so you can then download it, keep it locally, and then you can read it on the tube and things for the days when you don't want to be outside or on Wi-Fi. And, of course, EPUB, you've got the additional option of a bookstore. So you can distribute EPUBs on a bookstore and give them to people on that. Or the other things, pretty much the same as um, PDFs. But what about HTML5? Well, of course, one of the big drawbacks about both of those is you need software on your machine to do that. So you first of all, they don't have to get the software. PC users will already have it. Other users may have software that will deal with it, but not consistently. But of course, with HTML5, you've all got the software pre-installed. Unless your computer is what we technically refer to as crap, you will have <laughs> a browser of some description on it, and that's all you need in order to digest HTML5 content, because it will have a browser. Now, the only drawback about this whole idea is sadly still the dreaded Internet Explorer. But even Internet Explorer is playing good these days, because from Internet Explorer 10 and upwards, you've got virtually consistent HTML5 with the other browsers. And in 11, it's even better. few things here and there, but more or less better than what you had in the past. And Internet Explorer 9 is mm, sort of there, but, you know... It might look like the slightly mutant brother you keep in the basement for years rather than the same document you sent out. But it would still often, I've been surprised, I've done really advanced HTML5 documents, looked at them, and then thought, right, let's have a laugh, let's see how it looks in IE9, and opened it up and gone, oh, it's very similar, almost the same. So you can get away, but of course, pre-Internet Explorer 9, no go. It will open up and there'll probably be a small thermonuclear explosion, and that will probably be all you will get. But in all the other browsers, um, in all of the versions for the last two or three years, most HTML5 content will work very adequately. And should you be using anything new and cutting edge, that might be an issue if anybody's got locked down to a version from a year or two ago. But apart from that, if you're just doing normal content, then it will work automatically in all those browsers, whichever one you like. And everybody will be looking affectionately at their favorite and with disgust at all the others. Out of interest, I'm bursting to know, does anybody use Opera? Again, we have that tumbleweed moment. <laughs> So, yes, I always wonder. I think the only people that use Opera are developers <laughs> who check their browsers work in it. Now, the other thing as well is how do we deliver it? How do you give somebody it? So you've already got the software installed. And the answer is the best way is to deliver it as a micro website. That's what the technicality is known as, a micro website. So what's a micro website? Well, it's a website in a website. Simple. So how does that work? Well, you've got your website. And your website will have its main <coughs> page, index HTML, and then it will have all the other hundreds or thousands of pages. If it's a corporate website, possibly millions of pages. In fact, there might be bits of corporate websites where no human being has ever been. They're usually that big with so much content. And of course, you'll have all of the subfolders like your CSS, your JavaScript, and assets like images, multimedia, fonts, whatever else you need, with all of the files and the content inside of that. Does that make sense? So that would be your normal website with all the bits, however many pages there are, etc. So how does your document fit in? Well, you have a microsite, which is in your website will be a little folder, and that will be for your document. And in there will sit a totally unrelated website that doesn't have any connections or bearings back to your main website. Is its own self-contained little micro world. Now, when you mention that, the people, they go, ooh. It's not on the main website. And the answer is, well, you get that same experience with PDF. If you link to a PDF on your page with links, when you click it, the PDF usually will open up in a new tab, and you'll be <coughs> inside of that document, and it doesn't bear any relationship to your website. And this is the same experience as that. Does that make sense? It'll open up, and then you're delivering in HTML a document 
that uses the web browser to look like a document and to be a document and to give you all the documenty things you love and know from a document, but it's not having to have the ownership of actually being part of that website. Making that it could be plug and played anywhere and would look the same and be used from wherever it is. And of course, in that little micro website, it has its own asset folders with its own asset files that all exist and live ready to be used. Does that make sense? And as that goes across, you will just link to the main document of that website from your main page and have it as a link that opens in a new tab. And Bob's your uncle, you've got an HTML5 document. Okay. And that's how that will sort of work. Now, and I forgot, I beautifully illustrated that with some graphics. <laughs> Enjoy the graphics in silent. And back again. Okay, so yeah, so you've got all of that there that you can use to open and access that particular sort of content. Now, when you're going to ship it to actually put on your website, the beautiful thing about it is when you've generated it, you've made it, you can then just select the folder, package it in a zip file, and then send it off to your web developer or upload it to your content management system or put it wherever. And then when you've got it on there, just go on your content management system to the page, write out a link and link to the index file as a new tab link. And there it is. It is all. So here's a little thing um, of a company that's already done that. Um, CBI did a report recently where they've been experimenting with this, and I was working with them on that project. And they wanted to have their latest report as a cool document that's platform agnostic that would work on mobiles and all these other things. But they didn't want to use PDF or EPUBs or any of those other things. They wanted it browser-based. And so we did some experimenting. And we knew it was a good idea because within two or three months of it being done, we noticed five other big publications started having magically very similar sort of content turning up using the same ideas. And then it was nominated for a design award, but sadly we lost to O2's Be More Cat. Which yeah. It's a bit annoying. <clears throat> How can cats dressed as dogs? I don't know. But anyway, so there it is on the website. And when you click on it like so, it will literally press and it will open in a new tab the document. And then that's what you see. That's the sort of landing page of the document. And so as you can see, you've got clickable links at the top to take you back to the website should you wish to go there. But other than that, it's not trying to offer you the website anymore. It's its own self-contained thing. And you've got now links that will take you through the document, um, tables of contents to navigate around it, and even links to get the document as a PDF. So that basically is the idea of how it works. And of course, as you navigate the document and you come up with other pages, then it's all on there. And um, um, on this occasion, we didn't opt for it, but we are going to, in future versions, have things like interactive charts and graphs and animations and video content and all sorts of really interesting things, whatever you want on the page. And of course you just navigate around and it's all there. And um, also as well, you can even have it so that actually as you turn up on mobile, the document being responsive adapts to give you it on a mobile. That's the sort of views you start getting down to mobile phones. And of course the menu system is the classic mobile menu system that opens from the top to allow you to navigate around your document, etc., and to view all those things. So that's literally how HTML5 can work if you want to make and build it with the documents, and that's how you would deliver it. So any browser can open it. You deliver it as a micro website, so your main website is there, and you have your document embedded on that website, and then you just link to it as a new tab, and that will then be your HTML5 document. And of course, you can then have a folder called documents, and it could be full of folders of all the HTML5 documents that you deliver. I don't understand what is the advantage. I mean. It's just the advantage above having just pages on your website. The whole advantage of having a portable file is that you can read it offline. Uh, well, I'm going to mention that, so I'm pleased about that question, because that's the next subject. But the major point at the moment is, it's not just delivering a document, it's delivering an interactive document, and a one that's platform agnostic. So well, the it's reason not really a document, it's just, it's just a website. Really. Um, it is a website. Well, I mean, it's, it's whatever. When you look at a bit of paper, is it a form, or is it a book? Or is it a leaflet? Or is it a brochure? They're all using the same medium of paper to deliver it. It's just that it's the way you look at how it's being delivered and what it's being used for. And on this occasion, as I'm saying, you're having to dispel that precognition of it's a website and actually take upon it. It is a website, absolutely. And it's the same way what people say it's not an app, it's a website when they're looking at a web app. I don't see yet how this is a document. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a thing that I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how it can work offline, but that's one of the things that you have. You have to suspend your disbelief in a way because you're using web technology to deliver a document, and it's a document because I've said it's a document, <laughs> and it looks like a document, and I'm using it like a document, and when I say to people, I say, would you like to read that document? Here's a link to it, and it comes up on the screen, and they see a document. 
Okay, it's using web technology to deliver it, but then if you're delivering it as an app, you'd be using app technology to deliver it. And if you're delivering it as PDF, then using PDF technology. And you could say, well, it's just a PDF, it's not a document. Okay, and it's the same argue. Don't be blinded by the technology you're using because actually that's just semantics. It's what you're doing with the technology. Okay? Now, the other thing as well is to address the issue of what happens when you are sort of offline as well is, of course, sending the document, shipping it around. You can email links. You can link to it on your main website. Also, as well, the advantage being web-based is it makes it very easy to spread it socially. So you can put on social networks and even build into the document itself that people can quote images, quote charts, tweet things, tweet parts of the documents. It makes it super easy to pass around your work and information where it's needed. And of course, being responsive design, that can be happening anywhere. So people can be on Facebook, can see somebody's tweeted a chart, like the look of that. I've never heard that sentence before, but like the look of the chart, open it up and go and read it. And then there, they're in the document and they can navigate around it and actually see the information. Now, when you are also working as well, you've got the very issue which you mentioned is what about being offline? So you're on a mobile device. And of course, you're viewing this nice document and you happen to be online which in London is a hard thing to achieve, especially as we are in the biggest not spot in London, which is Waterloo. Um, how are you going to do it when you get the dreaded thing of going on the underground or wherever and you don't have any signal? Well, HTML5 has already given that solution as part of its normal everyday thing, and it's a solution that was given, again, for web apps. So the idea was if you're using a web app, and you're delivering it in a browser, then of course you get the very same issue because it's actually a website and not an app. What do you want to do when you're not online? Does that mean you can't use your apps? So the same technology that was developed to solve that, and that again is just using a website with semantics of it being an app, is actually the same thing that you can use for a document. Because you can use that very same technology to make the document also work offline. So when you've gone there and you've seen it and you've bookmarked it, you could then be on the tube and click the link and it will still be on your device and it will still be readable. And the technology will allow you to view it offline. So you can literally look at it whenever you want. It just takes one visit and then it's there on your machines. Now, the technology is called the application cache. But most developers will refer to it as a cache manifest. And very simply, what you do is it's a standard technology that works across all HTML5 browsers. So you literally just attach it to your website and you're telling the browser that this website is designed for offline use. So as I say, this was originally designed for web apps, but can be used on any website that you wish it to be. And when you attach it, it's just a, a list that explains to the browser all of the files it needs to store locally in order for that document to operate. Now, you don't need to put all the files on there. So you could, if you want to, leave video files and other content online. And actually even give what's called fallback content, which is if these bits are not local, then instead something would come up like a placeholder image. If it's a really big image, you might say, well, let's not store that locally. Let's just have instead a much bigger image, uh, a placeholder image. So it comes up saying you need to be online to view this image or you need to be online to view those videos. But essentially, you can list all the content that the browser needs and it will then enable that content to work perfectly offline. So when you rock up in your browser, and your browser opens up the page, the browser is immediately told there is a cache manifest by your web page. And what it will then start to do is it will read that file. And in the background, it will open up the browser cache and then instantly start to download all the documents and files invisibly without you having to do anything as you are using that page. Now, what will happen is your browser has like limits and things on how big caches could be. And if it goes over a certain size, it will usually ask permission for you to do that, but you get like a certain size permission free. And that is still, to be quite honest, evolving as to how they're dealing with those size limits, because Apple themselves have changed their mind twice on how that was working. But you can still deliver um, a decent sized document within you know, 10, 20 megabytes and have that being stored locally. So it means you could even put video content. So as you're using it, it's all downloading when you're online, it's being stored locally, and that's it. That's all the <coughs> user has to do. Other than if they think, I'd like to read that again, press bookmark. There it is. So then when they're on the tube, they can open up their browser. And that bookmark could even be stored on the whole folder. And you can actually get little JavaScript plugins that will actually point to the install button on iPads to say, if you want to, put this on your home folder. And then you'll get an icon with all your other apps that will then say, my lovely document, with a little icon and things. So when you click it, you don't even see the browser. It just comes up 
with your document, and you can view your document and then just navigate around it. Yeah? So, um, so just go back a step a bit. You know when you said when you go into your browser cache, mm -hmm. is that automatic? Yes. So the user doesn't have to do any input at all, unless, of course, they've visited preferences and turned off browser caches, which you can do if you wish. But um, it is an automatic process that you don't need to, as the user to do anything about. So other than just bookmark the page, which you can either do using bookmarks or on Apple's devices, you can send it to your home page to actually have as an icon on your home page, then it means once you've viewed that document once, it'll be on your computer. Now, if you don't go back within a certain time period or you do lots of other things that cache and the space is needed, it will drop it off. and It works out what to keep on your device based on how often you use it and things like that. Yep. Sorry, so when it's when it's saved on your computer, yep. is it saved just in the browser cache? It's saved in the browser. It's saved in the browser cache, and it's a place to be kept permanently. So if you use that regularly, <coughs> it would be permanently existing. Okay. Yeah. It could, is there oh, sorry. a way, Leo? Yeah. Sorry, that you could um, you could then save it to a different place on your computer, like in Lite, for instance. You would do a PDF. Um, no, that's one That's one limitation of it, in fact, is that it's not portable in that respect. But it is portable in the sense that it can be viewed offline. So you've just got to visit it. You've just got, to, you've just got to use it and interact with it in the browser. So your, bra your browser, in a sense, becomes your equivalent Kindle. Tab. Yes, but the portability of it is basically the link. So unlike a PDF whereby how many times have you gone to email a PDF and it's too big? And, oh, no. You can just therefore email a link to the page and everybody will get it. So the portability of the document is really just a link. And then anybody can view the link, and then when you visit it, it installs itself onto your device and is then able to be read offline, online. And in fact, what's also interesting is once the manifest is run, it never uses the online version again. So that means all of your big images and everything will open up at lightning speed because they will all be local. So you won't have to wait for things to download in the background. It will just book and pop up on the screen and be usable from your local side. Is that how a normal website is? Um works when it's put in a cache. Um, it and does, but the difference is, but the difference with a normal website is the cache is then deleted after you've used the website and it's not persisted for very long. But with an application cache, it's permanently persisted and it's stored and your computer sets aside a certain amount of space to store these. So for example, I've got a couple of web apps which are HTML5 apps on my phone and I've installed them once and I'm using them now about six months later and they're still on the device. Whereas if that was a normal web browser cache, I would have to keep reinstalling it, and in fact, the second I was offline, they wouldn't even let me visit it. Yeah? And, and with a normal website as well, things only get put into the cache as you visit the local website. That's right. Whereas here, it downloads the It pre-downloads it, that's right. So it's sort of like pre-caches the content for, which of course delivers better performance. So then instead of waiting for pages and big images to slowly trickle in, they will immediately flash up because they're already stored locally. So the first page will be a bit of stress as all this goes on in the background, but the user's not aware, and as they're reading the first page or looking at it, it probably will be done. And if they're on a decent broadband connection, it will be finished by the time they're ready to move on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if the content was then updated, um, how can you keep that? Uh, uh, what will happen is, when you update your content, as long as something is different in the cache, then the browser will re-download everything else. And if you're doing it as a web developer, then what they would do is they usually have a comment that has the publication date and then if that comment changes, the publication date changes, then every time in the browser, if it's already downloaded it, it will then instantly download a brand new version of the browser and then give you that content in itself. Okay, yeah? Sorry. Um, how do you make PDF out of this? Is this an easy thing? Or do you uh, have to well, start the PDF, I mean, the PDF... I mean, the, there's one way you can make a PDF. If you really weren't developing the PDF specifically, then, of course, what you can do is you can, of course, just print the website as a PDF and then have a styles built in that handles how it looks as a PDF. So then you could do print, but you'd be printing each page. It would be not messy, but it would be a little bit more time consuming. On the occasions when this was done, the company was doing a print version anyway. So that became the PDF, and this was the digital version of the print document. So then the print document, it had a PDF automatically as it went along. Now, just moving along, because um, although we started late, apparently I don't have the luxury of too much more time, um, making the content can be done in a manner of ways. You need to build HTML5, CSS, and if you want an interactive JavaScript. And of course, the tricky thing is, what's the best ways to do this? Well, at the moment, to do the design documents, there are a couple of programs I would recommend, Edge Reflow, and if you don't have any of the Adobe tools, there is an amazing web app called Front. And it's free to use and to try it out. And 
Front is a subscription service, but you can try it out for free, and it will allow you to build a beautiful, responsive design, and it works the same way as if you were using InDesign, but you can make your design there, and it's got the sizes for desktop, tablet, etc., and literally your content automatically resizes, and then you adjust it to taste and move things around, and you can design the versions. And then when you finish, your whole design comes out as a zip file. So that's your zip file already done, and you put it online. The only thing it wouldn't do would be to add things like a cache manifest, but it would allow you to add other widgets and things. But again, a web developer could do that for you as process of putting it onto your systems. And Edge Reflow is a real app rather than a web service, and that's by Adobe, and that does exactly the same thing. Now, in my opinion, Front is a bit more advanced because this is still beta software. Therefore, it's a bit glitchy and a bit crashy, but um, it's still pretty good to use. And on this side... <laughs> There isn't, as of yet, any products that are there, but I will show you very quickly one product which I'm actually working on myself. Um, I'm, because there is a big demand for this now, and it's coming up and a lot of people are wanting to do this, people want a workflow to go from a Word document to this HTML5 interactive document, and I'm actually developing a solution that will do that. Now, I was going to demo it and show it to you, because literally I have a Word document, and it uses the H1 tags to create the different pages. So the idea is your chapters are marked in H1, and then literally you press a button, and you've got to a template your whole document laid out. In fact, it was the system we used to build the Global Futures document for the CBI. That was literally a Word document, and a button was pushed, and it became that. And then in there, without writing any code, you can navigate the document and add maps, video, animations, edge animations, um, you know, tables, um, video, audio, whatever you like, and then it will allow you to do all of that without writing a single line of code. Now, in terms of if you're going to use those applications... They will do the page layout, and if you want to do animations and other things, then Adobe Edge Animate is a brilliant package to use, but also Apple's Keynote, if anybody is Mac-based, that also can export all your content as HTML5. So you can do beautiful recordings of, like, just like this presentation, because this is done with Keynote, and then you could record video and put it onto YouTube and then put that video on your site, or if you want it to be interactive... I could make all these things clickable and they jump to different slides with all the same animations and then Keynote would export that as an interactive HTML5 document which could then be placed onto your page as an interactive animation you could navigate. And Adobe Edge would do the same thing, Adobe Edge Animate, but it's a bit more complex because you have to do a lot of JavaScript when you want to make things interactive, whereas Keynote can do it without a single line of code. So it's interesting to know that you've got those couple of options. Now, I'll very quickly show you because um, I think I'm more or less out of time, but I'll very quickly show you. Here is the system for um, front. Oh, tell you what, if I bring it up in Google, it would be better. And as I say, you can sign up for a free account, try this out and experiment with it. It will work on... Google Chrome, that's the only browser at the moment it supports, but it does plan to support most browsers by the time it's finished. And when you're actually inside of there, it gives you a load of pre-made documents. And as you can see, all these documents have three states, mobile, tablet, and desktop, although you can add other states to your design as well if you wish. And then literally, you would just create your document like so, and you're immediately in a world of page layout, just like you are in InDesign, and this is in the browser. And then, of course, you can add text, you can add images, you can add video, and it has a huge library of pre-made content you can use. But also, you can add your own web widgets. So you can say, I'm going to do an animation or an interactive chart or whatever, and then when that's developed, just put it onto your site and paste it in. And then when you finish, you just very simply come up to say share, and then it comes out with a box for you to email it, and Front will house it online, so you don't even need to put it on your own web <coughs> server. It can be stored online, and then you can use it. Or alternatively, if you come to export, you can see there's all the code, and you just press download as a zip file, and you've got the whole thing ready to use. And that's a complete responsive design, whereby as you develop it, as you can see, it changes your design. That's the mobile portrait, mobile landscape, and the design effortlessly glides between all the sizes in between. So you can then just say, I want this to be this size on one size, and on the other size as well. Now, in terms of the system that I'm developing and working on, um, this system in itself, when you log into it, it allows you to create the document. Literally, you can just set up, it's like, a, it's like a proper system, so you can have projects and multiple projects and documents, and it will make all of these directly from Word documents. So here's a little Word document that I was going to import and bring into it, and as you can see, there's a document using the same template as the Global Futures, and this literally took 
a few seconds to make because I just imported the Word document and it flowed into the template. And the templates themselves are written with just pure HTML and CSS. And you can add your own JavaScript as well for interactivity. So it's very easy to make templates, but we're also going to introduce a system to make these templates without writing any code. So it'll be quite a neat system when it comes out. And as you can see, there's the iPhone version landscape, the iPhone version portrait, the iPad, etc. And if I want to edit the document, when I just bring up the editor, I literally have a word processor where I can manage the footnotes, the content that's on there. And I've got a nice code-free system here to say I've uploaded all these assets and you can add and upload images, video, other sorts of content, and also all retro computers, and then come into structure and I can then literally start to add text boxes, images, charts, Excel documents, widgets, and if I add myself a widget to the document, I've got all sorts of layouts like pull quotes and other things that I can then add. So this is content you can then add once you've got your Word document in, but your Word document will appear with all your footnotes and all your images ready to go. And then when you finish, you just literally select your document and then view it and preview it and then press download and that will be in a zip file ready for you to put on your website. Now if you are interested in that, because this is not yet ready, this is um, still in early beta phases, um, we plan to release this probably by the end of the year, the beginning of next year, but if anybody's interested in being a beta tester to get access to this before it's released, try it out. If you go to the following web link, which is html5interactivedocuments.com and for free when we get nearer the time we will send you some links to a free trial version to test it out and then that also will give you the opportunity to do feature requests to say things like what you would like it to be done and we plan on getting this as a usable product by sort of the middle of next year so this should be out and usable and it'll be based either on a subscription system where you use it online or you can buy it to use it locally on your own network should security be an issue so you can install that and work with that without having to actually use it online because that would be on your own internal internet. And that's the sort of product they'll say. So if you want to go there, just fill in those details and don't expect a hefty newsletter regularly because it, it literally will probably be near the end of the year before you'd hear anything. But we'll have your details and then we can forward it on to you. And that at the moment is the only system which is being designed for the long word style document and as a solution for quickly building those. If you want to do the page layout variants, this is not really suitable. It's more best to use web tools and to use front or reflow which are designed for making websites. But as you know, that's just semantics. Make a document and you can use that for your laid out documents. Alright, anyway, so hopefully that's what, that's given you a few ideas about looking beyond HTML5 as just web and just web apps and thinking about it also as well as interactive documents and to build those. Okay. Thanks.